Brother Ernie, I'm wondering how much it would be if I begged people. <laughs> I tell you, it's, uh, it was a blessing. I had a goal in mind, and you exceeded that goal. And I just appreciate that so much. Thank you for your graciousness in giving. So I wanted to share that with you. I've asked uh, Brother Ed Thomas to pray for us. And uh, he's right here. He's going to pray in just a moment. I want you to remember the following people in prayer. Uh, Bill Everhart, of course, the tumor was removed, but the biopsy came back cancerous. And so there's continued concerns about cancer. Tom Cooper, Tom Cooper is undergoing holistic uh, treatment right now. He's starting on a regimen. In fact, I, I saw him a week and a half ago uh, in his home. He was comfortable enough to have me come into his home. And he was starting a, uh, a routine uh, with a doctor that's a holistic doctor. So just pray for Tom. Um, they're really just looking for anything right now that, that might help them. So continue to pray for Tom Cooper. John Weidick is still recovering. John Weidick uh, really has been through a horrible ordeal, but uh, he's, he's on the mend now and he's recovering. We're thankful for that. I did want to mention that Rick Ward, I did ask his permission to mention this today. He will be moving. His last Sunday is August the 9th, and we will miss him. But he's going to be moving down to Southern Illinois to be around his family. And he has a prayer request. Please pray for his home to sell, okay? So I've been there. I, I understand that, wanting your home to sell. So. Please pray for Rick uh, as he transitions and pray for the home to sell. And then, of course, pray for our country, obviously. Let's pray for this virus to subside. It's just hard to know what, what to believe anymore. Uh, this past week, 300 clinics in Florida were caught over-reporting as much as 100%. Basically, everyone that was tested, tested, they were saying that they were positive. And there's financial incentives involved in a lot of that. And so it's just hard to know what to believe anymore. And a lot of people are struggling with that. Let's just pray that this virus will die down, subside. I think we would all want that, right? Yeah. So let's pray about that. Pray for our country. Obviously, uh, out in California, I read an email from Matt Staver, Liberty Council, and the governor there is closing churches down again in 30 different counties. They're not allowed to have any indoor services but of course the protests are being allowed uh, just enraged me absolutely enraged me so we need to pray especially for our brothers and sisters in christ out in california other places as well we live in trouble sometimes we need god amen we need god so uh we will start congregational singing in august and i stated this last week if you have any concerns about that just wear a mask during the time but I just don't think I can go much longer, folks. I'm all about congregational singing. Really, that's what the scripture teaches. And I just don't think I can go much longer with us not doing it. So we will start doing it the first Sunday of August. We'll also start the Truth Project on Sunday night uh, as well on August the 2nd. But please stand, and Brother Ed Thomas is going to lead us in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come to your house for uh, worship and for singing and for prayer. And we just, uh, we, Lord, we would not know what we uh, would be able to do without uh, having a place like this to come. We realize that the, the church is the body of people, not the building. But it's so nice to meet together and to talk with each other and to uh, share our needs. And, and we just uh, thank you so much that we can come. We pray for the uh, individuals that was mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, we think of uh, uh, Bill Everhart, and also want to remember Carol as he's now uh, had this tumor taken out, but now has chemotherapy to go through. And just pray that you'll continue to be with him. Just be with Tom Cooper and uh, also Susie and that whole situation there as he sees a different doctor for a different approach to. Uh, the problem that he has and just to pray lord that that will be able to be taken care of we also remember uh, uh john whitey and his situation has had a long road coming back from the, the 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 situation he was dealing with and just be with the doctors as they continue to advise him on what should be done we pray for our country at this time and as, as pastor mark mentioned the uh the, uh, some churches out in California, 30 different counties are closing down again now. And it just, uh, it's just unfathomable. And just pray, Lord, that uh, uh, 
uh, this country can uh, get a hold of this virus and pray it'll calm down and just plain go away. Yes. And it's caused us so much difficulty uh, over this past uh, four months. It's just uh, been uh, something that uh, most of us have never dealt with before. And uh, I might even say all of us have not dealt with something to this extent for so long. We pray for our country in the regard to the uh, racial unrest and the, uh, the protests and the uh, riots that have happened and are still happening to an extent in a few small areas. And just uh, pray, Lord, that uh, these people who are doing this will realize the, uh, the, the problems they're causing. And the, uh, just to pray, Lord, that they'll have a pang of conscience about uh, what's going on. And pray, Lord, that they'll find you in some way and realize that they've strayed away from you and uh, they need you rather than uh, all the protesting that is going on. We pray, too, that you'll be with Pastor Mark as he uh, gives the message this morning. We just thank you so much for, for him. We thank you for Dave Kissler, who was here this past week. And just thank you for the great love offering that was taken for him. Continue, with, uh, help him continue in the ministry that he has on the uh, on the, uh, in the Capitol and all the various uh, things, him and Nathan and others that uh, help in that ministry. We just thank you so much that they uh, uh, just see so many good things happening in Washington that we, never, we will never see on news, but we hear it from him and understand that good things are happening, and we thank you so much for that. Again, be with our services this morning. We thank you for the freedom we have to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just remain standing for just a moment, please, so you can stretch your legs a little bit. I know we're doing things differently right now. I want to talk to those who are watching via the live stream. We have upwards of 30 people uh, in our congregation who do not feel comfortable coming at the present time, but we want you to know we're glad you're watching right now. Are we glad? Bible Baptist family? Yes. Yeah. Right. It's not the same without you. And we so long to see you back here and, and hope we get to the point with this virus, with it settling down, that you'll feel comfortable coming and being in our midst once again. But we want you to still feel connected. I called uh, those people who are not comfortable coming a week or so ago and talked with them over the phone. But it's not the same as seeing you, so I long to see you once again here at Bible Baptist Church. I also want to say this. Uh, I'm a handshaker. My wife's a hugger. You know, we all have different things. You know, sometimes people, when you pray, they want to hold hands. I'm not into all that. I just, I just, everybody's different, right? You know, so people, when they pray, they always want to hold hands and get in a circle. I, I'm not saying I won't do that. If you reach your hand, I'm not going to slap it. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But everybody has different things they're comfortable with. And I'm, I'm a handshaker. My wife is a, a hugger. And I'm not doing that right now because I don't know who's comfortable with shaking hands. My wife doesn't know who's comfortable with receiving hugs. So if you are comfortable with that, you just reach your hand out because I'm fine with it. My wife is fine with hugs, but we want to be respectful of all of you, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're not trying to be unfriendly. I almost feel unfriendly when I'm walking around just doing this. It's just not me. I want to shake your hand, right? That's what I've done for eight years. So anyway, I wanted to mention something else as well. Um, Madeline and her husband are here. Yes, sir, they're, they're married up here. I'm afraid I might mess this last name up. Brendan, how do you say the last name? Olauson. Olauson. Yes, your mother told me before the service, but I forgot it before I got up here. I could run for president, but anyway. Brendan <laughs> Olauson. Uh, Brendan Olauson. Well, we're glad to have the Olauson's with us. Amen. So how long has it been? How many weeks? They're looking at each other. You don't know? <laughs> Two months. All right. And they're still married. That's a good thing, right? I've often heard the first year is the hardest. So let them know today that you're praying for them. The Olisons. Did I say it right? I didn't say it right. Okay. Pray for them. Pray for them. I am so sorry. But please be seated. All right, so I'm going to show you this um, video that I showed you at the end of the service last week. We're going to show that again today, and then I'll make a few comments. This is something that's happening in Washington in September. This is Jonathan Young. 
We are standing at a pivotal moment in American history and world history. A moment that can permanently seal our nation's course and the course of the world for good, for bad, for calamity, for redemption. America and much of Western civilization was founded on a biblical foundation stone, but it's turned away from that foundation. We have not only driven God out of our public life and have called what is good evil and what is sin good, but we have sacrificed the lives of over 60 million unborn children. And America's fall from God is not only progressing, it's accelerating to the point that it's no longer just a falling away, but a war against the purposes of God. I wrote in the Harbinger of the signs of judgment that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel, warning of calamity, that these same signs of warning have now appeared on American soil. The biblical template concerning judgment is that the nation so warned is given a space of time to return or to head for judgment and calamity. We are now in that window of time. But if America continues on its present course, that window will come to an end and there will come a flood that will begin the end of religious freedom, even usher in persecution and seal America's fall. And if America falls, it will affect the entire world. This year, 2020, is crucial as it leads to a presidential election in which the stakes are higher and the necessity of prayer more critical than ever before. And even if the election goes in the direction of biblical values and righteousness, if we don't see a spiritual turning, an awakening, a repentance, revival, then all the political, legal, judicial, and cultural efforts will ultimately fail or be undone. We have a window of time, and the purpose of that window is to return and for revival. Without that return, America will be lost. What can we do? What can you do? In the days following 9-11, people flocked to houses of worship, and it looked as if there could have been a spiritual revival, an awakening, but it never came because there was no repentance. And without repentance, without a turning back, there can be no revival. But I have seen once in my life the hand of God change the course of American and world history. And it all began not in the halls of government, but with the people of God who gathered in a sacred assembly in our nation's capital with the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It can happen again. But if we don't respond now, at this most critical moment, we may never have the chance to do so again. Since the time of 9-11, I've been calling for return, for repentance, for revival, not only as individuals, but as a nation, according to 2 Chronicles 7.14. At the same time, a faithful man of God, Kevin Jessup, has for years carried the burden of a sacred assembly for that same purpose of restoration. We are convicted that now is the time. Therefore, this is the announcing of the return, the national and global day of prayer and repentance. It will be a day and more than a day, a time and a season for the movement for prayer, repentance, return, and revival. The central day will be Saturday, September 26th in a sacred assembly according to what is laid forth in scripture to take place in our nation's capital on the Washington Mall. For those who can't make it, or want to do something where you are, then gather together in your states, your cities, in your towns, in your houses of worship, in your homes, or be part of those gatherings already planned. This will take place not only 40 days before the presidential election, but also on the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower, in the days of America's founding and dedication to God. And surrounding the day of return on September 26th will be 10 days, known from ancient times as the 10 days of repentance, starting with the Feast of Trumpets and ending on the Day of Atonement, to set as a special time to intensify our prayers, our intercessions for repentance and revival. 
September 18th to September 28th. Believers and leaders who are already part of the return include everybody from Pat Robertson to Dr. James Dobson, from Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lotz, to Martin Luther King's niece, Alveda King, and many, many more. When does the return begin? Right now. How? With you and me as we commit this time and this year for return, prayer, repentance, and revival. To commit first to our own repentance and to begin actually living in revival. And then to pray for others, the return and revival of our nation and the world. You who are parents, begin by leading your families in revival. Ministers, lead your groups in revival. Pastors, lead your churches into revival. Leaders of ministries, movements, and denominations, lead your people into revival. And spread the word to everybody you can. Let the believers, pastors, and churches in your areas know. Use social media. Use everything you can to spread the word so they can have a part. And if you're watching this and you're not sure you know God or that your life is in his will, then come to him now or come back to him now. And then come join in in the return. So I invite you to come to the nation's capital on the Washington Mall. September 26th, 2020. Plan now. You can rent buses, trains, cars, planes, however you can come. Or gather wherever you are. And if you're watching this from a nation outside of America, you can be part of bringing the return to your nation by doing what I've set forth in this message and going to the return website for more information. I'll be sending out more messages as we go forth. But for now, for more information, to have a greater part, to represent the return in your area, or to stay up to date. If you're not already on that site, go to the website for the return, which is easy to remember. It's thereturnwebsite.org. That's thereturnwebsite.org. The Lord is calling. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The movement and chance we have before us now may never come again. If we don't return now, we may pass the point of no return. So now, in view of the calling and of the moment before us, let us each rise to that call, to do what he has called us to do, to believe for great and mighty things we know not of, to return and seek to live in revival and become messengers of revival. It's time to break up our fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord as never before. It's time to return. flooded with God's people uh, that weekend. And so if you would like to go, we're not chartering a bus or anything like that. We are taking a trip to D.C. next summer. If you're, if you're interested in that, you can let me know. But we're not chartering a bus to go to this event. You will be responsible for your own accommodations, your own um, traveling accommodations and so forth and uh, hotel accommodations. So if you have any questions, please see me. I hope that many of you will be able to go. We want to go and pray for revival. Amen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And we need our land to be healed, do we not? We need our land to be healed. But even if you're not going, you can start praying. We can start praying. I hope that you're praying daily for our country. We desperately need revival more so than ever before. And discerning Discerning believers understand where we are right now. Discerning believers understand 
Uh, we are at a crossroads in our nation right now. That's not, her, that's not hyperbolic speech. That is the absolute truth. And we must pray. We must turn back to God. 2 Chronicles 7.14. So I wanted to show that to you. Once again, we'll have updates as we get closer to September the 26th. Now, I want to preach to you today. I haven't preached uh, this past week, and my heart is full from all the preaching I received. And today, I want to preach myself. Jim's going to help me with uh, the presentation. My remote uh, seems not to be working, so Jim will be helping with that. I appreciate his help and Kim's help and all those who help and assist with the service. Take your Bible. Turn to Exodus chapter 10, please. Exodus chapter 10. We're going to return to the series on Moses. And I just want to say that the last two plagues are by far the worst of all. Now, these last two plagues, darkness and death, so greatly affected and impacted Pharaoh that his will, his spirit are broken. He finally releases the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, but this came at the unbelievable price of judgment coming upon the entire land. So Moses, the reluctant miracle worker that we talked about several weeks ago, Moses, the reluctant miracle worker, has gained the victory. And God, God has delivered Israel with a mighty hand, and Pharaoh has yielded. However, he's paid an awful, awful price for his disobedience to God. So today, I want you to notice the title of the message. Simply, we're going to talk about darkness, death, and deliverance. Darkness, death, and deliverance. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'll bless in the next few minutes and help me to remember what I've studied. I pray that this message will be received by those who are before me. Help us to have open ears, open hearts. I pray that you'll work in our hearts and lives as only you can. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's talk about this plague of darkness. First of all, this plague of darkness. If you take your Bible, look at verse 21 of chapter 10. Moses and the darkness. Notice on the screen, chapter 10 and verse 21, the scripture reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Now notice that. Darkness which may be felt. This was intense darkness, another level darkness. In fact, you'll see this type of darkness, or this earth will experience this type of darkness in the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave and they've turned out all the lights. Has anyone had that experience before? Okay, it's, it's a different level of darkness, right? It's intense darkness. Now, if we met tonight after the sun uh, goes down, if we met in this room and, and all of a sudden the lights just went out, we would still have some light coming in from this glass window over here. So most of us do not uh, normally experience darkness that's so intense you cannot see your hand in front of your face. The Bible says this darkness was so intense it could actually be felt. Now remember from a previous message I've already stated that these plagues sent from God were doing attacks on particular Egyptian gods. And so this plague of darkness that God sent was a direct attack on the Egyptian god, Ra, the sun god. So first of all, this darkness was so intense it could be felt. But notice verse 22, the Bible tells us, and Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. So not only was it so intense it could be felt, the Bible says it was a thick darkness. This speaks of calamity. This speaks of gloominess. Now, Jewish tradition says that the Egyptians, they were absolutely terrified of this darkness because they believed that it was accompanied by evil spirits, evil demons who were screaming awful sounds, awful moanings, awful utterances. Let me say this, if three days of demonized darkness could, could lead to this level of terror among the Egyptians, and in fact this level of terror in Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that time, if this level of darkness could cause that amount of fear and terror, how awful must eternal darkness be? You know, there's not a lot of talk in church these days about hell. There's not a lot of talk. It's not compassionate. It's not politically correct. It's not palatable. It's not easy on the ears. It's considered uncouth. 
We don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about the love of Jesus, right? We don't want to talk about hell. And this is compounded by the humanism that's in our country that I've spoken about. Uh, people believe that they are basically good. And so people, when I say this, I'm making a general statement. People do not see themselves deserving of this awful place the Bible calls hell. Ultimately, the lake of fire. So if you read in the Old Testament, uh, you, you see uh, the word for hell, shield. It means place of the departed spirits. And in the New Testament, Hades, place of the departed spirits. Gehenna, the lake of fire. Ultimately, the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 8, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now, what do we know about hell? We know the Bible describes it in many ways. It is described as a place of darkness. It's also described as a place of, of fire. You may say, Pastor, that's a contradiction. How can it be a place of darkness and be a place of fire? I'll tell you, uh, I'll be the first to admit that I don't understand everything about hell. I don't understand everything about heaven, for that matter. But I do know the Bible describes this place as a place of darkness. And at the very least, what that means is the light of God will not be present and people will be lost eternally at the very least. That's what that's talking about. And also it's a place of fire. A place where someone that will have a body conditioned to withstand the flames of the fire for eternity, but their body will never be consumed. They will be tormented in the flames of hell. May I say to you that Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven? Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, Jesus said, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Remember the rich man in hell, the gospel of Luke. The Bible says that in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he cried out, Father Abraham, see Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Why? Because I'm tormented. I'm tormented in this flame. Jesus had a lot to say about this place called hell. And may I say, anyone in this room who ends up in this place, it's not for a day, it's not for a week, it's not for a month, it's not for a year, it's not for 10 years, or 25 years, or 50 years, or 100 years, or 1,000 years, or a million years, or a billion years, or a trillion years, or a quadrillion years. We're talking about forever and ever 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 and ever. You say, Pastor, I don't believe that. I can't fathom that. I can't wrap my mind around that. I just reject that idea. I reject that teaching of Scripture. Excuse me, you'll believe it one second after you breathe your last breath. Right. And for eternity, I can't think of anything worse than people coming to this church every single week and hearing the gospel, me pointing people to Jesus Christ, but yet you not truly being born again yourself and spending eternity in hell. And forever you will see this gray-headed preacher warning you about this awful place called hell. You may say, Pastor, everybody in this church thinks I'm a believer. Everybody thinks I'm born again. Everybody thinks I'm a Christian. You better swallow your pride, my friend. It's not worth it. Pastor, you're trying to scare me. You ought to be scared. Yeah. Notice what it says. The fearful. Right at the head of the list. Revelation 21 and verse 8. The fearful. The unbelieving. The abominable. Murderers. Whoremongers. Sorcerers. Idolaters. All liars. Shall have their part. In the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Which is. The second death. You know when someone's dying, and I've been next to people when they're dying. I've been next to people when they breathe their last breath. They cease to exist. But this place is described as the second death. It's described as eternal death, where you are continually in a death process, but you never cease to exist. Your body designed to withstand the flames of hell. Your body never consumed by those flames forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you better trust Christ today. Amen. It's not worth it. Pastor people, they think I'm they think I'm a Christian. I'm a deacon in this church. I've been in this church for 40 years. Everybody, everybody thinks, hey, I'm gonna tell you something. Stop listening to the devil right now. If you were to admit that you're not truly born again today and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I assure you, I assure you that everyone in here. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but I will say this. 
the overwhelming majority of everyone in this room would rejoice just like the angels in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. Do not leave today without putting your faith and trust in Christ. So I thought about that this past week when Pharaoh was trembling, shaking in his boots because of this plague of darkness, sheer terror. What will eternal darkness be like? So Moses in the darkness, let's go on and talk about something else. Let's talk about this darkness not only being felt, this darkness not only being thick, this darkness not only being uh, intense. Let's talk about it being divided. Take your Bible. Look at verse 23. Here's what the Bible says in verse 23. They saw not one another. Neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So notice this. This darkness was so dark it could be felt. It was thick, but it was divided. So here you had the Egyptians in their homes, and it was so dark they could not even see their hand in front of their face. I believe they were not even able to light candles. Okay. So they're experiencing this intense darkness. They're afraid to move. They're afraid to leave their homes. That's what we're told. But the Israelites, there's light in their homes. Isn't that what the verse says? Oh, my. We need some encouragement, don't we? We need some encouragement. I'll tell you what. Uh, everything that we're seeing happen in our country right now is just so discouraging. God's people need some encouragement. So the pastor is going to encourage you right now. Listen, I don't care how dark it is in our country, the rioting, the looting, the virus, the racial strife. Uh, I don't care what's going on politically. I want you to understand biblically. It doesn't matter what's going on. God's people, the children of God, always, always have light, even when the world is engulfed in darkness. And why is that? Because the children of God have the light of the world. Jesus is called the light of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 46, I've come a light into the world that men should not abide in darkness. I don't care how dark it is in our country. I don't care how dark it is in our world. The children of God will always have light because we have Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Notice something else. There's a principle to be found. Take your Bible. Look at verses 24 through 27. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For there must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. So we must understand something. God will not tolerate incomplete obedience. So here's what Pharaoh says to Moses. Okay, okay, white flag time. Okay, Moses, you can go. Your people can go. Take your children. You can go. But you can't take your flocks and you can't take your herds. Well, if you've been listening to my messages, God's already revealed to Moses that when the Israelites, when they finally exit Egypt, they're going to take the spoils of Egypt. So now Pharaoh is saying to Moses, no, 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 you're not, you're not uh, going to take our stuff. Pharaoh said, you're not going to take my stuff. You're not going to take the Egyptian stuff. And you're not even going to take your stuff. You're not going to take the herds. You're not going to take the flocks. So Moses probably was wondering how we're we supposed to survive without our herds, without our flocks. But he mentioned something that's more of a spiritual nature. He says, what are we going to offer to God? I like that. He's thinking in spiritual terms. What will we offer? What sacrifice? How will we offer sacrifices to our God? See, God had already made it known. Once again, that once the Israelites exited, they were going to take the spoils of Egypt God will not tolerate incomplete obedience. Now listen, once God's will is made known, he expects total and complete obedience. He has the right to do that. He's God. He's our creator, right? He has the right to demand anything. In him we have our life. In him we have our being. In him we have our breath. Without him we have nothing. Without him we are nothing. He has every right to demand anything. And when he demands something, he expects total and complete obedience. So I started thinking about this in relation to salvation. God will not bargain 
with sinners. There's not going to be any compromise. No, God will not bargain with sinners. It is Christ's blood or nothing. You know, a lot of people out there teaching, there's many ways to God. We all serve the same God. We're talking about this in, in uh, our life group. By the way, we started back today with Sunday school, life groups, also kid men. You saw the children leave. So we're gradually moving into our, our church being fully uh, fully reopened. But in, in class today, we were talking about the fact that so many people have this idea that we're we're all serving the same God. All these different religions know we're not, we're not all serving the same God. And there's, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way. There's not many ways. Pastor, that's politically incorrect. Once again, that is, that is so distasteful what you just said. The idea there's only one way to heaven. May I say to you, I'm going to believe Jesus any day over anyone in this room or outside of this room. Well, certain theologians say such and such. I don't care. I don't care how many doctoral degrees they may have. I'm going to believe the words of Jesus any day over any theologian, anyone in this room or outside of this room. I'm going to believe the words of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There are not many ways to heaven. We will not get to heaven. Humanity will not get to heaven through Confucius, through Buddhism, through Islam, through Roman Catholicism, uh, Protestantism. Uh, people will not get to heaven through this church, this Baptist church. They will not get to heaven through their good works. They will not get to heaven through their pastor, through their priest, through a missionary, through an evangelist, they will only get to heaven through the one who shed his blood over 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Yeah. That is the only way. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Pastor, what about people who've never heard of Jesus? That's a good question. You know what the Bible teaches us in the Old Testament and in the New? God gives light to all men. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's Old Testament. New Testament. The Apostle Paul made it clear that God has revealed himself through creation so that man is without excuse. No man can claim ignorance. God has revealed himself to all men. And how man responds to that light determines whether or not he receives more light. Let me say this simplistically. If someone is seeking the truth, God is going to make sure the truth reaches their ears. Amen. Pastor, you have evidence of that. Absolutely. Acts chapter 8 in the New Testament. Here's what we're told. We're told about a man, Philip, Philip the evangelist. He's, at, he's in Samaria. Wonderful things are happening. God is moving in a mighty way. There's a man in the desert, an Ethiopian eunuch. He's riding in a chariot. He's seeking the truth. He's reading from a scroll. He's reading from Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 53, which points to the crucifixion. He doesn't understand what he's reading. And God told Philip the evangelist to leave this, this uh, great revival, if you will, that was taking place in Samaria and go down into the desert. Why? Because that eunuch was seeking the truth. And God made sure that the truth reached his ears. Why do you think we have missionaries that go all over the world because God is making sure if someone is seeking the truth that the truth reaches their ears. So don't let anyone throw that objection at you. It's Jesus and Jesus only. Jesus said once again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we see Pharaoh trying to strike a compromise. God had already spoken. And God has already spoken about salvation. There will not be any compromise. No, you read in the Gospel of Matthew. You read about these people standing at the great white throne judgment. God the Father has, has given all judgment to God the Son. That's what we're told in Scripture. And so one by one, individuals stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who shed his blood on the cross. And what do they say? Because they're being condemned to the lake of fire. What do they say? Didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? We did all these good works. We did all these things for you, God. And then they will hear the words, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You know why? 
because they trusted in themselves and they trusted in their religion and in their denomination and in their church and in their good works and the fact that they served as a deacon or sang in the choir or went to church every Sunday or the fact that they were moral. My friend, there's not going to be any compromise at the great white throne judgment. It's Jesus and Jesus only. He is the only means of salvation. And if you're not in a church where the pastor will stand up and say exactly what I'm saying right now, you need to run as fast as you can. Right. Because this is the truth of Jesus Christ. I want to move on now and talk about the death of the firstborn. Notice on the screen the death of the firstborn. And I want to talk about some principles concerning these plagues. God's judgment comes slowly and becomes progressively worse. Also, God will turn away his wrath if only men will repent. Yes. What about Nineveh in the Old Testament in the day of Jonah? Nineveh repented. And by the way, who led them in this repentance? It was the king, if you read in the scripture. Now we know that later on Nineveh was destroyed, but not in the day of Jonah. In the day of Jonah, there was a revival that took place. And the king, can you imagine what it would be like if this would happen in our country? The mayor of Champaign, the, the governor of our state, Governor Pritzker, the president of the United States. Can you imagine what it would be if our elected, what it would be like if our elected officials, I know they're not kings, some of them think they are, no, I understand, but they're not kings. But can you imagine if they led our nation in revival? How refreshing would that be? You see, and what you see as you study scripture, God, yes, he's turned away his wrath when people have been willing to repent. None of a prime example. Now, with that said, I want you to understand it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an almighty God whose anger is not quenched. And all you have to do is look at the great flood. All you have to do is look at Sodom and Gomorrah. All you have to do is read the book of Revelation and read about tribulation events. And you will see that it truly is a fearful, fearful thing to fall into the hands of an almighty God whose anger is not quenched. Now, what I love about the Bible is that it gives us a panoramic snapshot of God. It shows the completeness of God. So you study the Old Testament, the emphasis is on the wrath of God. You study the New Testament, the emphasis is on the love of God. Now, we know you put everything together in the Scripture. We understand that concerning God, His main attribute is, is holiness, and everything revolves around His holiness. You also, as you study the Scripture, you find out certain patterns of our God. You see that, yes, he is, he is long-suffering. He is patient. Let me give you some examples. If you read the Old Testament account in the book of Genesis, he was patient with people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Did he not give them an opportunity to repent? Yes. yes. What about in the day of Noah? Did he not give those people an opportunity to repent? Yes. And by the way, he gave them a long, long time to repent, right? We're not talking days, weeks, months. We're not talking years. We're talking decades. We're talking a long, long time God gave man ample time to repent before he sent the great flood. Now, may I say to you that God has given man more than ample time to repent since Jesus died on that cross over 2,000 years. What do the scoffers say? Where's the promise of his coming? That's what we're telling the scriptures. The scoffers say, where's the promise of his coming? You preachers, you've been preaching about this. For how long have you been talking about one day? Jesus, yes, it's Jesus who died. And yes, he rose again. Yeah, and you're, you're saying that he's going to come back. And there's going to be this awful, awful time of tribulation on the earth such as the world has never seen. You've been preaching about that for years and years and years. And many of you preachers, you died. You, you passed off the scene. And it hasn't happened. Do not mistake the fact that it hasn't happened. Do not think that means it will not happen. I want, to, I want to say this by the authority of God's word. Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. He will take believers off of this earth. And there will be a tribulation period such as this world has never known. Read Revelation. It tells you all about it. But you know, as you're reading the, the scripture, as you're looking at patterns of God and you're seeing his patience, right? He was patient with people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was patient a long, long time before he sent the flood in the day of Noah. And, and, and uh, 
my, my soul. I mean, over 2,000 years since Jesus died. That is ample patience. When you say that's patience, when you say that's long suffering, I know with God, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is a thousand years. But may I say to you, by any metric, anyone would say over 2,000 years, that is more than ample time for people to repent. But one thing I've discovered, and you'll see this clearly as you work through Scripture, while God is exhibiting patience and long suffering, He's storing up wrath. And my friend, when he drops the hammer, he drops it hard. Read about Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed by hellfire and brimstone. Read about it. What about the great flood? We know, right? The whole world covered with the floodwaters. And read about the tribulation period. My friend, God is giving man ample time to repent. It says in the New Testament, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but his long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is being long suffering. He's patient. He's being patient with humanity. He's being patient. Sometimes I look around and I say, God, why don't you just send down fire to consume the wickedness that's in this world? God is patient. But there's going to come a day when that patience runs out. Man can mock, man can laugh, but my friend, when he drops that hammer and the tribulation begins, it's going to be wrath full force, such as this world has never seen. So that's what I see as I consider these plagues. His judgment comes slowly, becomes progressively worse. He's willing to turn from his wrath if men will only repent, and is fearful to fall into the hands of an almighty God when his fear is not quenched. But I want us to look in just a moment at... Exodus chapter 11 verse 7 God always makes a distinction when it comes to his people when it comes to judgment I should say where his people are concerned I'm going to say that again God always makes a distinction when it comes to judgment where his people are concerned so take your Bible look at Exodus chapter 11 and verse 7 here's what it says but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that you may know how that the Lord did put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Now, the institution of the Passover is an illustration of God making a difference. Take your Bible, look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 11 through 14. Here's what it says, verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, there's no escaping death without the shedding of blood, the blood of the Lamb. Take your Bible and look at verses 22 and 23. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. So. God always makes a distinction when it comes to judgment where his people are concerned. And the institution of the Passover is an illustration of God making a difference. And no escaping death without the blood of the Lamb. Now we know, we know what happened. We've read some verses, not all the verses, but we, we know what happened when God supervised the death. Yes, he did. He supervised the death of all the firstborns and he took the destroyer, commonly referred to as the angel of death or the death angel. He took uh, the destroyer into Egypt and the destroyer was to go inside of the homes of people in Egypt and take the life of the firstborn. The Israelites were instructed to take blood, the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it on the doorpost so that when God uh, took the destroyer into Egypt, Egypt, the destroyer, the angel of death, would see the blood on the doorpost and pass over the homes of the Israelites, hence the term Passover. What an incredible picture of the ultimate Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? This is, this is where these songs come from. You know, these songs that we sing, there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name 
Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. What about this song, this old song? When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Hey, you want some more encouragement today? You want some more encouragement? For those in this room who've understood your sinfulness, that you were born a sinner, and that because of your sin you were separated from God, and you've understood that if you died in that sinful state, you would be eternally separated from God, and you heard the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings, that Jesus Christ died on a cross to shed, uh, to, to pay for your sins, shedding his blood, and you trusted Christ, you called upon Christ to save you, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart uh, that, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you believed on him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. If you called upon Christ to save you, and you have been born again, regenerated as the scripture teaches, I want you to hear me, and hear me well. Don't miss this. You've been sleeping, wake up. you got to hear this. This is really encouraging, okay? I wasn't looking at anybody, not accusing anybody. I scan, okay? So I'm not, I'm just saying we, we need to get this, folks. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the destroyer, the angel of death, the death angel has no power over you. Yeah. Somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. Why? You said, Pastor, wait a minute now. We're going to die. I mean, you talked about your dad dying a few weeks ago. We're going to die unless Christ comes back in a lifetime. Yes, physical death is transitional. We, temp we, we transition from the temporal into the eternal, from the physical into the spiritual, right? It's, it's a transitional time. But even then, God is walking us to the other side. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff. They comfort me. He goes with us all the way through this life as believers, and it even transitions us to the other side. But I want you to understand the destroyer does not have power over us because the Bible teaches that those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and had the blood applied to their heart, those who have trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. They will live with God forever and ever in the manifested presence of God. The death angel has no power over us. And this is why Paul said in the New Testament, he said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Yeah. Death has no power. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have yeah. everlasting life. Yes. Get that down deep in your soul, child of God. Don't forget that. So the last thing I want to talk to you about today is Moses and God's deliverance. God's deliverance is total and complete. Take your Bible, look at chapter 12, verses 29 through 32. Chapter 12, beginning at verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. God's deliverance, total, complete. Israel was in bondage for 430 years, according to Exodus 12, verses 40 and 41. God's deliverance may not be the shortest and easiest way, but it's always the best way. Exodus 13, 17 through 18. Once they exited Egypt, God did not take them the shortest and easiest way. He had a reason for not taking them the shortest and easiest way. God's way, although not necessarily the shortest and easiest, is always the best way. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, and all I need to do is follow the song, says right God's deliverance, although miraculous, will not provide strength to those who have no faith. This is important. 
God's deliverance, although miraculous, will not provide strength to those who have no faith. Take your Bible. Look at Exodus 14, verses 9 through 11. Exodus 14, verses 9 through 11. Here's what it says. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea. Go down to verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because... Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not, uh, is, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Oh, my. So they've experienced this incredible deliverance, the Israelites. They had, they've come out of Egypt. Incredible deliverance. God's broken the wheel, the spirit of the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh. And the Israelites have exited Egypt. But now they get to an insurmountable, or at least it looks like an insurmountable circumstance, right? An obstacle. Oh, Moses, why didn't we just stay in Egypt? Wouldn't have God if we were just stayed in Egypt and just died in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here, Moses, to die? Why? 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 You can just hear the pity party going on, right? You don't ever do that, do you? Yeah, we all do from time to time. You say, Pastor, how could they have done that? The same way that we do it, even though we have experienced incredible deliverance from sin. But when we face seemingly insurmountable obstacles or circumstances, why, God? Why me? Why? You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to truly have faith in it. We walk by faith, not by sight. God wants us to truly have faith in it. You know what a lot of people think when they think of faith? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have faith because that's belief that God's going to take my problem away. That's faith. God's going to take my problem away. I got this problem, I got this financial problem, I have this emotional problem, I have this physical problem, I have this relational problem. I've got faith God's going to take it away. May I say to you, God doesn't always take away those problems, does he? Let me give you a better understanding of faith. Faith is saying, I'm going to believe God, period. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament, they're told, you have to bow down to this golden image. If you don't bow down to this golden image, you're going to be taken and thrown into a fiery furnace. You will die a, a horrible death. And I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. We believe our God is able to deliver us. But if not, read it. You see, they determined that they were going to obey God whether he delivered them out of that fiery furnace or not. That is faith. Faith is saying, I'm going to believe God, period, that he knows what's best. He does what's best. Once again, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness, and all I have to do is follow. I'm just going to believe God. He doesn't have to operate the way that I want him to. And by the way, he's not going to. He's God. And faith is saying, I'm just going to believe him. With everything that happens, because he knows what's best, he does what's best. You know how important that is in this time of COVID? It's so important. Regardless of the decisions that you come to, and I'll be respectful of any decisions that you come to. I, I, I mean that, okay? But regardless of any decisions that you come to concerning how you should operate in this age of COVID, let's make sure that we're doing what we believe God would want us to do. Can you do that? I mean, I'm not asking much there. I'm just asking you to simply do what you believe God. God has led you to a point of believing that you're operating the way that he wants you to operate, right? That's the way we should be operating in this day and time. But regardless of any decisions that we make, whether it's feeling comfortable to come here or staying home or wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, regardless of any decisions, none of us need to be dominated by fear. We heard that last week, right? Walk by faith, not by sight. So, they're at the Red Sea. What's going to happen? 
God's deliverance provides power to fight our battles for us. Look at Exodus 14, 13, and 14. Exodus 14, 13, 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord, I love this verse, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now, they're at the Red Sea. And I've said, I've been preaching since I was 17 years old. I don't know how many times I've said this. I can't wait to get to heaven because I want to see a rerun of the Red Sea party. And see now, now it's, 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 I want a CD. I want to get into God's CD collection, right? Let me have a little fun. God, can you take me into your CD collection, you know? Or DVD, right, DVD. I'm, see, I'm messing up there. Can I get into your DVD collection, God? And, yeah, Mark, why do you want to get into my DVD collection? Well, God, I want to get to one with the Red Sea party. Okay? I know he doesn't need a DVD collection. Just let me have fun up here, okay? So I'm going to go into the DVD library, and God's going to take me and say, right here, Mark, this is it right here. This is the DVD, the actual Red Sea party. I can't wait. I want to see it, right? Until then, I just have to imagine. I have to watch movies. And, and you know, years ago, back in 1998, a movie called The Prince of Egypt came out. And at that point, it was one of, I think it was one of the, most astounding works of animation I had ever seen up until that point. I know they've advanced dramatically since 1998. But uh, this is animated, but this is going to give you a little clue of what it was like when the Red Sea party. We've got a video that we're going to show. I had to work on this video with lighting and everything. We're going to have to take out all the lights. I hope that you can see it well. It took me a long time to get it to where I think it's it's uh, good visually for you to see. It's about six minutes long, but let's just enjoy this reenactment of the Red Sea party.
That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? But God's DVD is going to be a lot better. I promise you. So can you imagine witnessing the Red Sea part? You see, God's deliverance provides power to fight our battles for us. Oh, last of all, I want to say that God's deliverance that is a blessing to his people is also a curse upon his enemies. We're not going to take time to read the verses, Exodus 14, verses 21 through 31. But the very place the Israelites marched through on dry ground, which was a place of blessing, God parted the Red Sea and the Israelites walked across. That was a place of blessing. But that very same place was a place of curse for the enemies because that's where they met their death. You see, here's what we're told in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. That our salvation is a savor of life to those who believe. But to those who do not believe, it's a savor of death. It's a stench of death. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand something. The same God who delivered the Israelites is our God. The same God who parted that Red Sea is our God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. The same God who brought Jesus out of the grave is the God that lives inside of us. We serve a powerful God. We need to understand that, acknowledge that, and then live as if we truly do know and serve a powerful God. And that's what I see, these final two plagues, an incredible demonstration of the almighty power of God and all God's people say. Let's all stand, every head bowed and every eye closed. You know, this message really is focused on Moses leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. We've also made practical application concerning the fact that we need deliverance as humanity. We need deliverance from our sin. In fact, Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world and humanity needs deliverance from this world system, deliverance from self, sin, and Satan. And the one who died on that cross over 2,000 years ago made it possible for all who believe to experience ultimate deliverance. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you're not sure that you have everlasting life, I want you to step out and take my hand and say, Pastor, I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. I want to know that I'm born again as taught in the scripture. I want to give you that opportunity. We're not going to sing together, but Dwayne is going to sing in just a moment. And if God has spoken to your heart, if you're not absolutely certain that you have everlasting life, just come and take my hand. For the believers in this room, perhaps God has worked in your heart through the message. God has spoken to you in some area of your life, maybe claiming the power of God and, and just trusting God, as I said, living by faith, understanding that he knows what's best and he does what's best and we just simply must trust him. If God has spoken to your heart, I want to encourage you to come in just a moment as Dwayne sings and just kneel down at this old fashioned altar. Don't hesitate. If God's spoken to your heart, if you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit in any area right now, don't resist that. Don't quench the spirit. If you're not saved, come. Talk to me. I'll have someone show you from the Bible how you can know with certainty heaven is your home.
same God who parted the Red Sea can save your soul. I encourage you once again, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, today is the day. Call upon Him. We're going to have one more verse. God has spoken to your heart. Just slip out and come and say, Pastor, I want to trust Christ as my Savior. Don't leave today without knowledge that you trust in Christ. Go not go with me, still I will follow. Go not go with me, still I will follow. Go not go with me, still I will follow. No turning Are you glad you came today? Yeah. You know, there's just nothing like being together with God's people. Someone told me today, or this past week, someone said, you know, when I go to Bible Baptist, I get something out of preaching. I didn't say anything, but that just encouraged me so much. I want you to get something from God's Word. One of the saddest things today in the Church of Jesus Christ is so many ministers make this a dull, lifeless book. This book is alive. Preachers need to preach it passionately, and we need to be excited about the God that we know and serve. Amen? Amen. He parted the Red Sea, and he lives inside of our hearts. Thank you so much for coming today. And once again, just a quick reminder, just a quick reminder, nothing tonight at the church. Uh, we have resumed Sunday school, life groups, kid men at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, and the children's program during the morning service. And this will continue for a couple of weeks. The first Sunday in August, we'll resume congregational singing. Once again, if you uh, prefer to wear a mask during that time, I will totally understand that. I'm not going to wear one up here, okay, because i got to lead you. But if you want to wear one, that's, that's fine. And then on Sunday night, the second, we'll start the Truth Project back up. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you today for what you've done in our hearts and lives this week of revival and then today as we've looked into your word and we've seen your might we've seen your power god we know that you are god mighty to save mighty to deliver and we we see that and we study the book of exodus and we also know that experientially we know what you've done in our hearts and lives and we just want to thank you for that father we love you bless us now as we go our separate ways for we ask these things in jesus precious and holy name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate it. I get in your way.